Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to the 100th episode of Talking Tudors. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger, and I'm delighted to have your company. To mark this very special milestone, I'm hosting a special giveaway. I urge you to head to my Instagram account at the most happy 78 for details, or just search the hashtag Talking Tudors. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank the wonderful listeners who continue to support this podcast via Podbean Patron, and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference, especially to us indie podcasters. I'd also like to say a very big thank you to everyone who's listened to all 100 episodes and who's supported this show from day one. I really could not have done it without your enthusiastic support and encouragement, so please keep those messages coming. If you love the podcast and tune in to every episode, perhaps you'd consider showing your support by becoming a Talking Tudors patron. Just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family, and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor-themed goodies, you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. February's prize is a vintage Anne of the Thousand Days movie brochure, and a copy of Sandra Vasoli's brilliant book, Anne Boleyn's letter from the Tower, a new assessment. If you've been thinking about supporting the work I do, then this is the perfect occasion. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about Margaret Tudor and 16th century Scotland is Dr. Linda Porter. Linda was born in Exeter, brought up in Kent, and is a graduate of the University of York, from which she holds a BA and a Doctorate of Philosophy in History. In a varied career, she has lived in Paris and New York, worked as a university lecturer and spent over 20 years in the corporate world. Linda has written five books, all published to critical acclaim. The latest, Mistresses, Sex and Scandal at the Court of Charles II, came out in April 2020. Her specialisation is the 16th to 18th centuries, with particular emphasis on the Tudors, the Stuarts and the French Revolution. She's a regular reviewer for the Literary Review and BBC History magazine and has spoken at many literary festivals. Our conversation is coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sayles. (laughs) 
welcome to Talking Tudors, Linda. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, Natalie, from a, a rather chilly Kent where I live, but uh, I'm looking forward to being able to go out again at the weekend because it's been so icy that unless you're young and properly booted, it's probably best to stay inside until it goes away. But I'm fine apart from that. Fabulous. All right. Well, I suppose a good place to start is you just introducing yourself to our listeners and just telling us a little bit about your background. Okay, well, uh, I I have perhaps a rather interesting and unusual background in that I've reinvented myself a couple of times, but I I guess that's not so uncommon nowadays. I was born in Exeter in Devon in the West Country of of England. I grew up in Kent, where I, I now live again. I've lived in Paris and New York. And in fact, my daughter, who now lives in Switzerland, so we haven't seen her for well over a year. She was born in in New York and I've lived back in the UK for for a long time now. So uh, I'm within easy reach of London. I'm in a very historic part of England. I was originally an academic, academic historian, teaching at various universities in and around New York City. When I came back to England, I needed a job which actually paid a reasonable salary and academic posts were hard to find. So I worked for nearly a quarter of a century, actually, in in the corporate world um, where I worked in public relations and communications. And when I left that, I decided I wanted to go back to my historical documents and my writing. I got myself a literary agent, which is an important thing if you want to enter mass market publishing. You can't really do it without an agent in non-fiction. And I've been with him since 2002. And I've published five books and I'm now working on a sixth, so, uh, which I will talk about a bit later perhaps. It's, it's highly relevant to this conversation. Fantastic. What a wonderful, all those cities to live in. That's incredible. I love that. Now, today we're going to be chatting about Margaret Tudor and life in 16th century Scotland. So Margaret, for anyone listening, was the second child and eldest daughter of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. It would be really great, Linda, if you could just paint a picture for us of what Scotland was like at around the time of Margaret's birth in November 1489. Well, Scotland uh, was in a uh, a rather um, difficult situation in 1489 because it had a very young king in James IV who had effectively just usurped his father's throne the previous year. And one of the things I think that's very interesting about the British Isles, and particularly England and Scotland at this time, is that people don't realise that the similarities between England and Scotland. I mean, both countries had kings who had come by their thrones in in what might be described as dubious ways, I think, uh, both in battle. Henry VII had actually, of course, affected the demise of Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485. Three years later, 14-year-old James Stuart, James IV of Scotland, in rebellion against his own father, won the Battle of um, Sauchie Burn, uh, and, which is close to Bannockburn. We don't know exactly where it is, but that's probably where it is, uh, the site of another famous Scottish battle. And so you have a very young king with possibly a rather tenuous hold on his throne in Scotland, very much under the thumb of some of the leading nobles and Scottish families, but determined in his own quiet way to ride out these early years and and to make his mark. Uh, He ruled a small, extremely poor, of course, and overwhelmingly rural, mountainous country. Many of his subjects lived on the islands or, or a few of them in the highlands of Scotland. It had a population, and we don't exactly know how much, but England's population at the time was around three million, and Scotland's was probably about half of that. So, so it is a very small country with only two sizable towns, Edinburgh and uh, the much smaller Glasgow. On the other hand, uh, Scotland had a a reputation as being a a place where links with Europe were important, both for the Scots themselves and strategically for other European countries. And it had a long history of friendship with France, the old alliance, which was destined to uh, annoy the English south of the border. So it's small and poor with a very minimal population. One in which, however, it's Stuart kings, who had been the dynasty on the throne since the late 14th century, uh, had a reputation for going out and being amongst their subjects. They were very much more sort of 
touchy feely, if you like, uh, than the Tudors certainly became. Uh, and it was important to them to see and be seen. Uh, they were all, of course, at that stage, because it's pre Reformation, sons of the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. The church in Scotland was under the indirect uh, control of, of the papacy. There were early signs of humanism and, and other new developments in the Scottish universities, St Andrews, for example, um, which had European renown. Uh, and Scotland itself had for many years been perhaps more north facing than south facing in that it had a tradition of its monarchs marrying into Scandinavian royal families. James IV's mother, for example, was Danish, Margaret of Denmark. And although that wasn't 100% the case, and there had been some English queens in Scotland, um, a role which wasn't always very easy for them, I, I would have to say. But, but predominantly the links trading and cultural uh, at that time were with Northern Europe, though they, there were, of course, quite a lot of links with France and a number of Scots had served the French kings in, in sort of private armies for a good many years. So although it's small and remote, it, it's by no means cut off. It's at the edge of Europe and has a quite significant from time to time role to play in European politics. And it has a history of difficult relationships with England. And at the beginning, so when Henry Henry VII ascends the throne, what's the relationship like then after, after he comes to the throne? Guarded, I would say, because I think both kings were, were sort of watching each other. And, and James IV was literally half Henry VII's age. He came to the throne at the age of 14 nearly 15. And his, his English counterpart was 28. Now, James had grown up in Scotland, but a, a rift in his parents' marriage, the cause of which is not precisely known, probably has to do with the rebellion of his, James IV's uncle, the Duke of Albany. The, the Scottish royal family seemed to always get on very well, it has to be said. Uh, I suppose that's a, a trend which continued south of the border in some other ways, but uh, there obviously was a rift in the marriage of James III, his father and Margaret of Denmark. She brought up their three sons, their three surviving sons, separately at Stirling Castle. So James IV had been well educated, but he had really long since, if he'd ever had it, lost the love of his father, who was a a strange and a man and not a very effective king. And he'd grown up under the guidance of his, his young mother, who was dead by, the, by her late 20s. She'd been married at the age of 12. You know, we tend to think that Margaret Beaufort, um, Henry VII's mother, must have been some sort of aberration, but she wasn't. It, it was quite common for girls, once they became literally physically of childbearing age at 12 or thereabouts, to get married. Uh, and Margaret of Denmark had, I don't think she had her, I remember quite how, I think she was a few years older than Margaret Beaufort when she had her first child. But nevertheless, this was less uncommon than, it raises people's eyebrows now. But of course, you have to consider that in those days, it didn't live nearly as long as we did, and that a woman's childbearing years were therefore comparatively shorter. So no, they didn't know each other. Um, they both came from unusual backgrounds. I mean, Henry VII had essentially spent half of his life outside England, living in Brittany and then in France. There was always tension between England and Scotland, particularly in the disputed area of the borders, which I think people nowadays find quite extraordinary because the borders are some of the most beautiful parts of the British Isles and they are peaceful and lovely. But in those days, they were not peaceful and lovely places to live at all. I mean, a lot of it was cattle raiding and burning of property and all that sort of thing but if it was your cattle raided and your house burnt down clearly your life was rather difficult the two kings didn't know one another and knew that their relationship would be significant but had little idea at that stage how it might develop I think because both were concerned in the late 1480s with establishing themselves on their thrones uh, on putting down rebellions against them because James faced um, one that wasn't so serious as some of the revolts against Henry VII, but he did face opposition. And so it's really a period of containment and building on what they had both achieved before they had time to think about how they would interact with each other, if you see what I mean. 
Absolutely. And we're going to move into a little bit about how they interacted in those links. But um, let's start with Margaret, just talking about Margaret. What was her early life like? And do we know much about it? Is there much in the sources? There, there isn't very much in the sources, partly because princesses were not viewed as important as, as princes, but also because the sources are fairly scant um, for the upbringing of, of royal children until they really move into an age in which they're either you know, likely to be married or likely to be about to gain the throne themselves. There, there is a bit more stuff coming to light particularly in the, the warrant books, which are the books of household payments um, for, oh, you know, almost anything from gifts to arms and, and really all sorts of small things. And it's from these nuggets that you can build up a, a bit of a picture of what these people were like. It's essentially how we understand medieval monarchs and nobles at all. And you can only glean bits of their personalities from what they spent their money on. And it isn't the whole picture, but it does reveal something. And Margaret grew up in the royal nursery, which was at the Palace of Sheen. It became Richmond Palace when it was rebuilt. It, it stood on the banks of the Thames in southwest London uh, and was therefore in countryside uh, at the time. I mean, there's still Richmond Common and green areas there, but it, it is just a suburb of London now. In those days, it was quite a separate place. It was quiet and peaceful. It was away from the sort of raucous and quite often violence of, of London itself, and therefore somewhat protected from sickness and, and things like that. And the nursery was under the control of Elizabeth of York, Henry's wife, his, his queen. And there Margaret grew up with a number of other siblings, some of whom came and went, sadly, as you probably know, because there were various children, who, boys and girls, who didn't survive. But she grew up there basically with Henry VIII, who was her younger brother, and at the time the Duke of York. He was not the heir to the throne, and eventually Princess Mary, her, her younger sister. Uh, it was a pleasant childhood. Margaret and Henry may well have had lessons together. She had a French tutor, a dancing master. She learned some of the pastimes of, of ladies of the period, um, particularly archery and things like that, which must have made you pretty fit, I think. I don't yes. think you can do archery if you're, you know, the sort that lies around on a sofa like a Jane Austen heroine. I don't think it works that way. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, but it was considered a noble lady's attribute at the, the time to be, be able to uh, shoot with a bow and arrow. And uh, of course, music. The Tudors were all very musical, uh, and so was so was Margaret. So she would have had the basic education of a lady. She would have been literate, though her handwriting was pretty appalling. But then, of course, in in those days, noble women normally dictated to a secretary. You might have written postscripts or in very unusual circumstances, penned a letter to your, to someone yourself, but that, that was uncommon. So the fact that Margaret's handwriting was difficult to read doesn't necessarily mean that she could barely write. It, it just means that she didn't necessarily have much occasion to. Um, so it would have been a, a rounded noble lady's education with the underlying aim, of course, of fitting her to be a queen consort, which is what she became. I was going to say, Natalie, we don't know very much more about it than that. Mm -hmm. And it was interrupted by the fact, by this serious fire in 1498, which burnt down the palace. Uh, and for a while, they all had to remove in, more into London while the other pal palace was being constructed around them. That must have been quite dramatic, actually. I don't think anyone's ever really thought about the effect that might have had on the royal children. But uh, while house fires were not uncommon in those days, to have your residence burnt down must have been quite traumatic, I would think. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm just thinking about Margaret when I'm trying to picture her in my mind. There's a couple of sort of portraits that come to mind. I don't know whether they're quite contemporary, but so do we know what she looked like? I know people like, I, I suppose it's a way of connecting with them, isn't it? And making them more real if we kind of can picture what they yeah, what they, they looked like and, and maybe her personality have, as well. Yeah, we have some idea of what she looked like. I mean, the, the um, portrait of her that you often see in which she's holding monkey actually um, after she was Queen of Scots is not contemporary, but may well have been based on a 16th and earlier 16th century portrait. There is a picture of her in, in the um, wonderful collection, uh, the Recoil de Haas, which years ago I spent a huge sum of money to get this absolutely wonderful book, which has all of these and other 
portraits and drawings of, of European upper class people in it. And it, it's, it shows her at about the time that she married James IV, in other words, when she was about 13, as a rather thin faced, pale looking girl. I mean, not unattractive, but not necessarily a great beauty. I mean, the, the beauty of the family was the younger sister, Princess Mary. And Margaret, of course, as was common with her mother and most other women of the time, grew considerably larger with consecutive pregnancies and childbearing. Uh, so that by the time she was in her mid to late 20s, uh, she was, how shall I put it, a great deal larger than she was at the age of 14. But that was inevitable in those days. So uh, she uh, she was, um, according to this sketch and drawing of her, uh, a rather thin-faced and serious looking girl. Um, she's been described by one historian as a tomboy, but I really, I don't think we have any evidence for that. And being good at archery doesn't mean you were a tomboy. As I said, it was just an, an attribute important for noble ladies at the time. But anyhow, she, uh, she grew up in a, a tranquil and loving environment with her siblings. And I, I think one of the most important things that people don't necessarily understand about this period and the one that went before it is that the Tudor, late medieval as this is, concept of childhood just doesn't correspond with us in any way. I mean, for example, the idea of being a teenager wouldn't have occurred to them. You know, by the time you were 12, you were thought to be an adult, both male and female, and your childhood was behind you at that stage. Margaret didn't grow up very much in contact with her elder brother, Prince Arthur, who was the heir to the throne, because when he was about six or seven, he was sent off to Wales, or the Welsh borders to Ludlow to be educated separately there, which was a tradition. Uh, there was a similar tradition in, in European monarchies. It, it wasn't just British. You know, the, the heir was normally raised and educated separately from the other children. So Margaret would have had a, a pleasant and, and loving childhood. Elizabeth of York appears to have been a, a, a woman who did inspire great affection in her children. I mean, there, there is some suggestion that Henry VIII was never quite the same after her death, mm. that he might actually have been quite a nice little boy before that. <laughs> He didn't turn into a very nice man, of course, but uh, and it would have been enjoyable and undemanding. Of course, they all learned to ride at an early age uh, and they would have been used to to servants and, and giving commands. And Margaret was raised, as I said, to be a, a queen consort and was able to fulfill that role very, very well. You mentioned that, of course, she goes off to marry James IV. But when did these negotiations for this particular marriage begin? Well, James was, of course, 17 years older than, than Margaret. And he was, I wouldn't say the most eligible bachelor in Europe in the sort of late 1490s, around the turn of the century, but he was certainly one of them, despite the, the sort of smallness and lack of, relative lack of prosperity of, of, of Scotland at the time. And he was a king, and that in itself was, was attractive to many other European monarchies. The first indication we, we have of the idea that there might be a marriage between Margaret and James actually came from Henry VII, her father, it was first mooted in 1496. But at that time, James was being particularly annoying to Henry because of his support of the pretender Perkin Warbeck, who you know, presented himself as Richard Duke of York uh, and is occasionally known as Richard IV. And uh, this may have been a, an idea on Henry's part to kind of cut through this burgeoning and very irritating alliance with all the dangers that it underlay it for the uh, English throne. But the negotiations didn't really start in earnest until the, the turn of the century. By that time, James, who, who was a, an indefatigable womanizer, had, had had a number of mistresses. He was still living with Janet Kennedy, his sort of live-in mistress at the time. But he knew that as he approached the age of 30, and he must use his marriageable status to his and Scotland's advantage. And Margaret was a, an obvious choice. Uh, he, at one stage, James would have, I think if he could have preferred to marry um, into one of the European ruling families. And he, he approached uh, Ferdinand and Isabella in Spain to be told that sadly they didn't have any daughters left. <laughs> Catherine, their youngest, had just been uh, betrothed to Prince Arthur in England. So he, he perhaps was running out of, of suitable young ladies at the time. Um, and there were obvious attractions in being married to the new dynasty in England's daughter. 
not the least of which was that, you know, Henry and Elizabeth of York had lost a number of children. They didn't actually know in 1500 that they were about to lose one of their two sons. But, but there was the possibility, distant as it must have seemed at the time, that it could give him a foothold in England uh, in the future. So uh, it was a diplomatic marriage. The English, and particularly Elizabeth of York and her, her mother-in-law, were not keen for Margaret to be formally married and, until she was 12 years of age, which may well have been an indication of the trauma that Margaret Beaufort had suffered at being married and made pregnant so young. They, they you know, they actually, Henry actually wrote to, or said to the uh, Spanish ambassador, they didn't want uh, Margaret to be married too young in case, you know, the King of Scots hurt her. <laughs> Presume a rather, you know, uh, obvious uh, mm -hmm. way of referring to, to what had happened to his own mother. But no, the, the Treaty of Perpetual Peace, is, uh, which, of which the marriage formed a major part, uh, it's a very optimistic name for Anglo-Scottish relations at the time, was actually signed at the beginning of 1502, in January 1502. And Margaret was married by proxy later, well, in early in 1503, in fact. And in between, of course, um, her mother died, which must have been very difficult for her. Uh, it was difficult for her. It was difficult for Henry the, the Seventh as well. It was a very dismal period because it had followed only less than a year earlier the death of Prince Arthur uh, after his marriage to, to Catherine of Aragon. So in the space of that time, from you know, the beginning of the, the, the 16th century, Margaret lost her elder brother, whom she seems to have been very fond of, though they can't have known each other personally all that well. Um, but there does seem to have been quite a lot of affection between them. And uh, she lost her mother as well. So that at the age of 13, she had to go north for the, the real wedding uh, to James IV, uh, having lost her, her mother, um, she left in June. Her mother had died in February. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the anniversary of her death was, was just yesterday, in fact. So, so sort of barely six months in between. Um, she had been referred to as the Queen of Scots at that time uh, after her proxy marriage because that was a legitimate title. But uh, this was something that appears to have annoyed her brother, Henry VIII, because he temporarily had to give precedence to her. Yes, I can imagine. I can see that getting on his <laughs> nerves. <laughs> seems to have got on his nerves in a rather permanent way but uh, although it's true that that in the early 16th century you were considered an adult at the age of 12 and Margaret was 13 when she actually went north to marry James IV it must have been a considerable strain for someone so young and being parted from everything she knew I mean having said that she went north with a huge entourage of English ladies and gentlemen and her own you know, religious confessor and advisor and everything. So she she wasn't alone in that respect, but but she was removed from an environment that she had grown up in, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. What a difficult time. And we are going to talk a little bit more about that journey north. I love hearing about all those, um, the details about those things. But before we do that, I just wanted to know a little bit more about James the Fourth. So you've mentioned that he was a bit of a womanizer, which is not fantastic. What else did, what did his contemporaries think of him? And was he a good leader by this point? Yes, he was. I mean, I, I think in respect, he was one of the most remarkable of the late medieval kings. What he is remembered for is, of course, is for losing his life at the Battle of Flotten in 1513. But before that, he had been a, a dynamic and charismatic king. He was enormously broad in his interests and, and abilities. He could speak numerous languages. Uh, he, he had a keen and restless intellect. He wanted to know all about the latest military developments, uh, both naval and, and in the, the army. He got advisors in from, from Europe. He sponsored, you know, the universities. Um, he was religious in the in the way of most men of his time. I mean, despite the numerous mistresses, and he had a quite a brood of illegitimate children, actually, by this time, growing up in Stirling Castle, uh, which was to be Margaret Tudor's dower castle. And she turfed them out very soon after she married him, or at least they got removed. We don't precisely know how this happened. But uh, James was one of those men from the past that I think it's hard to dislike, actually, because there are many things about him that, that touch a chord. Someone who was so 
charismatic, who loved culture and music, um, who obviously was quite irresistible to women. I mean, he wasn't exactly a handsome man, but his portrait, again, based on a, an earlier one, probably it's not contemporary, shows a man with sort of reddish brown, the, the Stuart colouring, hair, holding a falcon. Um, he was very keen on hunting. He was also an extremely physical man, very, very fit. He could ride 100 miles a day, obviously not on the same horse, <laughs> but, uh, but he could. He frequently walked to various of the pilgrimage sites in Scotland, you know, which, which took days to do. Meeting and greeting people on the way, he dispensed justice in the sort of travelling assize system that they, they had in Scotland. He did that on a personal level. His subjects, apart from a few disgruntled nobles, and there are always disgruntled nobles in almost any country in Europe at the time, his subjects appear to have adored him. And his, his achievement in making Scotland small and impoverished as it was. A real European power is something which I, I think is, is often overlooked and, and underestimated. So it, it was a, a really quite remarkable man, and in, in almost every respect, the complete antithesis of her father. In uh, Henry VII is a difficult man to know. I think it's still acknowledged by historians that, that we really don't know very much about him. But he, in, and in his portraits, he looks wary, but then you would look wary if you'd come by the throne the way he did and had constant attempts to displace you. And he seems to have been an affectionate husband and father. And Margaret's personal letters to him bear witness to that, I think. But James, but by the time that, in fact, that Margaret left to go north, Henry VII was already showing some signs of illness, probably tuberculosis, which eventually killed him. So, so she would have gone from this quite a man though apparently when Henry VII got involved in conversation he was quite animated and very interesting to, to listen to you know to, to this medium height well-built very muscular fit man of, of just under 30 when she married him who uh, had tremendous popularity with his subjects and was always eager to be doing things and learning more and and getting his nobles around him I mean one of Henry one of James IV's great successes in dealing with the Scottish nobles God knows they were not easy to deal with, as many Scottish monarchs found to their cost, uh, was to make his court very much the centre of their lives so that they wanted to be there. And when they were there, he could keep an eye on them, of course. Uh, one of his hobbies, because he was interested in science, was dentistry. And, and one shivers for the occasional Scottish noble who had to, you know, uh, perhaps unwisely... <laughs> had admitted that he had toothache and the, the monarch would oblige by, you know, fiddling around and removing it. And I, I think it was an offer you couldn't refuse probably at the time. Um, so he, he was interested in all kinds of things. But what his court lacked and, of course, what a court needed in those days to sort of highlight both its cultural state and as well as its religious functions was a queen consort. And he didn't have that. And that was the role that, that Margaret was to fill. Uh, James had to train her in it to some degree because she wasn't familiar with Scotland uh, and she wasn't familiar with being a queen. And she was only, I mean, she had her 14th birthday within three months of, of arriving there of her wedding. But their marriage was probably, you know, not always uh, on an even keel. James did have mistresses after his marriage, but not, you know, in the way that he, he had before. And it, as a partnership, it seems to have worked very, very well. He, he got this young girl whom he could train and mould um, to be a queen. And he did treat her with a great deal of support and affection and respect. You know, she, she had all the clothes and jewellery and, and everything else she wanted. She was given lands in Scotland. Um, she was treated as befitted the role that she had and expected to, to carry out her role as well as a, as a queen, which she did extremely successfully. It does sound fascinating. Now you've made me want to go and, and find out more about him. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm a great fan of, yes. of James IV. I think most people who have read and know anything about him are. I mean, his, his achievements you know, did, I suppose, come to naught, at least in the immediate sense after the Battle of Flodden, uh, where he was killed. But he had established Scotland as, as a, having a role in Europe by then, and that, that didn't disappear with his death. It was m muted for a while, but it, it didn't go away completely. But of course, his loss was a tremendous blow to Margaret.
let's go back a little bit and talk a little bit more about the journey north. I'd love to hear a little bit about perhaps do we know where she stopped off, who was yes, part yes, of her do. entourage? Uh, rather fortuitously, we have quite a lot of information about it because she was accompanied north by, by the Somerset Herald. And, you know, heralds were, they were almost like roving reporters in, in, in a way. You know, it was their job to note down and chronicle what happened on the journey and then write it up in a way that that could be well could be used as propaganda quite honestly and of course the whole journey was a great propaganda coup for Henry VII you know he, he didn't wave Margaret Tudor goodbye at Collie Weston her, her grandmother's home and sort of think well you know that's that uh, it, w- it was all very carefully planned and she traveled slowly in stages north she made major entrances on an organised basis to to some of the major cities, particularly York, which was, of course, the second city of of England and had its own archbishop. She went north with several hundred people in her her entourage. It was led by the Earl of Surrey, whom Margaret grew very resentful of, both en route and particularly in Scotland, because she thought, I think she thought he was stealing some of her thunder, which, given his personality, probably was. But (laughs) Uh, It it must have been a very gruelling journey, um, supported as she was by lots of ladies and gentlemen. She had to be there, visible, you know, meeting and greeting dignitaries, not exactly on a daily basis. She'd stop, you know, a couple of nights in most places. She left in early July and actually crossed the border into Scotland in in early August. So uh, it it was deliberately a long journey and it was designed to show the magnificence and stability of the the Tudor dynasty. Um, And she was the living representation of it. So quite a a responsibility and and a bit like a modern celebrity. Um, Before she made her official entrance into some of these major cities on on route through the Midlands and the north of England and and eventually over the border after Berwick-on-Tweed, she had to be, you know, dressed in in a different outfit and, and presumably made up and all of that because they did have cosmetics of a sort in those days. And it must have been extraordinarily tiring uh, as well as as very demanding in in a mental sense as well uh, and although you know very well supported on each part of the way um margaret seems to have handled this with with great aplomb uh it was a big opportunity for the dignitaries of these various towns the mayors and the aldermen and also the local nobles many of whom as she got farther north had quite tenuous links with with the court in london i mean if you were one of the percy family the earls of northumberland your job was essentially to hold the border for the the monarch. Uh, You were a very mighty subject in your local area, but going down to London on a regular basis to appear at court was as much of an undertaking as as was Margaret going north, essentially. Of course, they all did come to court from time to time, but it it wasn't necessarily a regular thing that they did. And so it was an opportunity for them to demonstrate their local power and wealth. You know, they all came out in velvets and silks. And it always amazes me how people wore velvet in those days in the height of the summer. It must have been horribly hot, but it, it was to show, you know, that you could afford this kind of thing. It really was a spectacle, one of the great spectacles of Tudor England, very early in the Tudor period, in the early 16th century. But it, it was, and we know a lot about it because it was chronicled by um, the Somerset Herald who accompanied Margaret. And it, it's often said that, that you know, the English who went north, the English nobles, gentlemen and ladies, were rather sniffy about the whole thing and particularly sniffy about Scotland when they got there, you know, and desperate to show that they thought they were superior but this doesn't come across in Somerset Herald's account he he's very impressed by the amount of time and money and effort that James IV had put into this is James had undertaken extensive rebuilding works at Holyrood House at Holyrood Palace to accommodate his queen and and have you know a, a permanent wing and residence for the for the queen consort and he had spared no expense and believe me he didn't have a lot of ready money <laughs> he ended up in debt as a result. Well, so yes, like a it's a wonderful fasc- journey. Yeah. It's, fasc- it's a fascinating journey. Yes, I mean you you um, see her arriving at these places not all, very often on horseback. She was often carried in a litter into these places, and then you know she gets out and meets people uh, in York. Of course, she uh, attended mass at the at the Minster, and this was something which you know people could see and and view. So it, again, it, it's it's a uh, 
a strong sign of the the Tudor's desire for display and visibility. Uh, and it, it, it is quite a remarkable journey undertaken by really such a young girl at the time. Absolutely. And one that had just, as you said, lost to know her mother and her brother not that long before. So in 1509, of course, Margaret's younger brother, Henry VIII, ascends the throne. So how did this affect Anglo-Scottish relations? It didn't do a lot for them, to be truthful. Uh, it, the Treaty of Perpetual Peace was already breaking down in that time because, you know, border raids were border raids were a way of life on both the English and Scottish side of the border. It was, it was just what people did. And in fact, there were a whole series of local laws and local courts in which the Scots and English had equal rights, which, which covered um, the whole area of the borders. Um, and something which I think is not widely known. It's very interesting, actually, if you're interested in legal things. But initially, there were various problems. Firstly, Henry VIII wished to, uh, who was only 17, of course, when he came to the throne, wished to establish himself quickly as a, as a force in his own right and to distance himself from his father. Uh, I mean, it's often said that, oh dear, you know, Henry VIII was actually not a bad lad until he fell off his horse in 1536 and was never the same again. But you have to remember that Henry VIII's first action was to execute two of his father's closest advisors, um, which I think is a portent of things to come, and who were really not guilty of anything other than carrying out the monarch's commands. But he, he knew they were unpopular. Uh, and so he thought that this would be a move that would establish himself. And of course, he saw James IV as a rival, uh, an older, more experienced king, um, hardened in fighting, because James had personally participated in some of the fighting, you know, with, with rebels in Scotland and, and, and things of that sort. Someone who who was married to his sister, who, of course, by that time he hadn't seen for, for six years, and who would potentially be a thorn in his side. James seems to have regarded Henry with a certain amount of elder brother in lawly contempt. <laughs> so it didn't make for the happiest relationship. And things got off on a rather bad footing and got worse because both Henry VII and Prince Arthur actually had left Margaret bequests in their wills, sums of money and also plate, you know, in other words, gold and silver and, and things of that sort. This Henry VIII refused to honour. Uh, his sister wrote to him in high dudgeon on various occasions. Uh, and then Henry VIII had more or less said, oh, well, you only want this because your husband's an impoverished Scot. He didn't actually put it in quite those terms, but that, that was the kind of message that, that, that lay behind this. And uh, James demanded this on his wife's behalf. Margaret got very incensed and wrote to her brother saying, you know, our husband is ever the better to us, you know, and you are withholding monies that, that are bequests that are due to me. And obviously, you know, the, the situation between England and Scotland was not going to remain stable for very long. It hadn't been stable for centuries um, and, and that wasn't going to continue. Continue. Henry had designs both early and late in his reign for glory in France, something which he signally failed to achieve, but he managed to make the best of it that he could. Uh, and of course, it, it was that particular area of both Scottish policy to France and English policy to France that eventually brought about the warfare that culminated in, in James IV's death. Because when Henry invaded France, which he did at the behest of Emperor Maximilian, the Habsburg Emperor, who was one of the French king's major rivals, but when Henry did that in 1512 to 13, James IV of Scotland was bound by treaty, though of course monarchs could and did break treaties, but he was bound by treaty to support Louis XII of France. And his, his invasion in August 1513 was intended as a diversionary tactic. The best hope he might have hoped to, to get as far as York and establish himself there, you know, thereby becoming a real danger to, to Henry. But as it was, he, he got you know, no farther south than northeast Northumberland. Having taken a number of these border fortresses, which were constantly being knocked down and then built up again in border warfare over hundreds and hundreds of years, they're, they're very fine to see, actually. With Henry in France, Catherine of Aragon, of course, as regent, was responsible for deploying, really, troops and, and, and developing with her council the, of advisors the policy. And she sent the Earl of Surrey north. And, of course, he had been the man who had brought... James IV, his bride, and was now to bring him something very different. He was old by that time, but he was a canny military man. James IV 
liked set piece battles. He'd read all about this. He's got all the advisors from France, Germany and Switzerland there. In practice, he had a larger force by a factor of two or three than, than, than the English force. But they were not as manoeuvrable as the English. And the ground on which Surrey, who'd outwitted James by marching at night to a, a, a new base, the ground on which they met below Brangston Hill in, in Northumberland was boggy. I mean, you can still see the fact that it's it in wet weather it is marshy there because I've actually been there it was one of the best sort of research trips I ever took um, because it is in a remote and beautiful part of northeastern England and no one ever goes there they just don't go there you know they just know nothing about it basically but it's got quite good information as you climb up the slope and see the top and you can see where James and his three separate divisions lined up with all his cannons. You know, he had the latest military equipment at the top of the hill. What he did not have was manoeuvrability. And although he came down the hill to a, a, a smaller force, they were more manoeuvrable. And they just cut him and his men off in this mire at the bottom. The fact that James had cannon was irrelevant under those circumstances. You know, essentially there was no one there to direct them. And James, like most, like Richard III, was a king who led from the front. And the slaughter was terrible. I mean, it was just mind boggling. At its worst, it's as bad as some of the slaughter at the Battle of the Somme. And it, it wiped out the flower of Scottish nobility. And James himself died, probably trying to reach Surrey in hand-to-hand combat. And he was identified on the field the next day by Lord Dacre, one of the northern lords who knew him well. And although there were the sort of rumours that there often were for sort of late medieval kings, as, as of Edward II, that, you know, he had somehow survived and gone on pilgrimage to Jerusalem and all that, he, he was dead uh, on the field. The news took a day or so to get back to Scotland. Margaret was at Linlithgow Castle at the time, which is a beautiful castle on a sea lock not far from Edinburgh, because she was pregnant. Um, she had by that time given birth to oh, more than half a dozen children, but only one had survived, Prince James, who was then about 18 months old, but she was pregnant with another child at the time. Uh, we don't know how she reacted when the news was brought to her. I mean, she must have been aware that there was a possibility that the battle would not go well. Whether she had feared in her mind that her husband might actually be killed, I don't think we could ever know. Uh, she, it's, it was reported, you know, in some of the later Scottish chroniclers that she'd been screaming around the tower of Linlithgow Castle, but I mean, Margaret wasn't a hysterical young woman, actually. And I think she would, I'd like to think she would have reacted with more dignity, but it did raise you know, all sorts of terrible problems. She was sufficiently gathered in her wits to participate in and help arrange the coronation of her little son. So she clearly hadn't fallen apart immediately. But being pregnant, being a woman, being a Tudor and being English was not an enviable position for someone who her husband had left her with the responsibility, tutrix, she was called. I mean, it's almost the same as being regent for her little son. And probably had they both had longer together, they'd been married for 10 years, he might have been able to train her in government uh, sufficiently for her to have have gained more of the confidence of the Scottish Lords. But the fact that she had not had to fill this role before, that she was pregnant, which inevitably made it more and more difficult for her to attend council meetings as her pregnancy went on. There were various factors that told against her. And of course, one crucial aspect of her being left in charge of her son was that she didn't remarry because James could have foreseen the difficulties that could and ultimately did ensue. You've talked already about some of those sort of immediate effects, I suppose, that her husband's death had. Are there any other ones that you'd like to mention? Of course, the population of Edinburgh was a fear that they were about to be, you know, attacked and slaughtered. But um, that didn't happen because this was, there is a pattern in 16th century Anglo-Scottish warfare that the Scots nearly always lose. There was one that they didn't lose in the 15. 15- 40s later on, Ancre and Moor, they nearly always lost, but the English could not invade and actually occupy. They simply didn't have the manpower or the wherewithal to do that. That wasn't how that sort of warfare worked at the time. It was destructive, but it did allow for some sort of normal life in, in Scotland to go on. The difficulty was that not all of the Scottish nobility had been wiped out, but a large number of families had lost 
a father or a son, and some had lost both. So there was still a pool of expertise and experience left, but there was always going to be opposition to Margaret. And Henry, of course, being in France at the time, of course, he returned, it doesn't seem to have given a great deal of thought to how he might profit from this. He didn't give much deal, a great deal of thought to how he could help his sister either, it has to be said, but he, he just, he was more sort of reactive on events. I think two things happened fairly speedily afterwards. Well, uh, Margaret gave birth the following spring to another son, which should have strengthened her position, but oddly enough, she doesn't seem to have thought that, that it did. And by the, the following summer, she was obviously sufficiently concerned about her own situation that she, she took a gamble that, that turned out to be a, a very serious error of judgment, though it is understandable. She married again. She mm. married Archibald Douglas, the Earl of Angus, who was a leading member of one of the great Scottish families. I mean, I, even I am some muddled. Earlier on in the Middle Ages, the Douglas family is split in two, and there are red Douglases and black Douglases, and I'm still trying to grapple with who is who. But um, Archibald Douglas came from a long line of people who had been close to the crown, and one of his forebears had actually been murdered by a Scottish king, was stabbed to death by James II. So the uh, relationship wasn't always necessarily a very close or happy one, uh, but, but they were very powerful, particularly in sort of southern Scotland, in the Lothians and the borders, where they were pretty much a law unto themselves, really. Any Scottish family that Margaret had married into would have brought forth the wrath of someone else. And you just could not have married someone where they said, oh, great, you know, we like him a lot. Yes. We'll listen to you now you're married to him. This, this, this just would not have happened. And it, it's, I mean, Margaret has been roundly criticised by historians through the years um, for, for this this second marriage and sort of compared unfavourably as is her granddaughter Mary Queen of Scots with Elizabeth I you know who we are all absolutely certain would have done swimmingly under these circumstances quite why we think that is a mystery to me because I don't see how Elizabeth could have done any better in Scotland than either Margaret or Mary Queen of Scots but that's that's for a, another sort of controversy I suppose but uh, yes she was immediately the um, Lords of, of the Council well, not immediately, but within a month or so, decided that she would be removed from the, the Regency. And they sent to France for James Stuart, Duke of Albany, who was the son of the Duke of Albany who'd rebelled against James III at the end of the 15th century. He's an interesting and little-known man. I mean, most of his papers are still in the Bibliothèque Nationale and haven't ever really been properly gone through. If libraries ever reopen, yes. I wouldn't mind going to trying to have a look at them or, or possibly paying a researcher to do it. You know, there are ways of doing this kind of thing. And uh, he'd been born and brought up in France. He didn't speak very good English. He certainly always wrote in French. Plus, which of course is the added problem in Scotland, they spoke Scots. People still argue over whether this is a separate language or just a sort of dialect of Northern English. But I can assure you, having tried to read it over many years, <laughs> that while some of it is recognisable, it, it is a very distinct uh, language of its own. Margaret had learned to speak it, incidentally, uh, which was necessary while she was there uh, and could speak it quite well by this time. It is interesting, I think, and, and a sign of how male dominated these societies still are, that they preferred a Frenchman who could barely function in their language at all to take charge of the country to an English queen who'd lived there for a decade, you know, who was the mother of their little king. Her action was thought to be so sort of stupidly feminine, I suppose, and a sign of weakness. And, and, and But Margaret may have even had some fears for her own safety without the protection of, of her husband. And that's not illegitimate in those days and in those kind of circumstances. And she's often been represented, even going back to um, Agnes Strickland, the formidable, you know, Victorian lady historian, as a sort of oversexed whinger who was only interested in clothing and jewellery and marrying younger men. But actually, the Earl of Angus was about the same age as her. Um, there was probably no more than a year between them. I mean, he was quite a good looking young man. He was a widow uh, himself. So they'd, be, they'd both lost a spouse not that long ago. And she was to find him a particularly difficult husband, of course, because as he started to assert himself over the years, he, he was a, a difficult unfaithful, unsupportive husband and a 
ghastly stepfather to poor James V, her son, as he grew up. But the marriage, you know, was undertaken in a positive spirit, I've no doubt, by Margaret, who thought it would help her. You know, as soon as she discovered that it hadn't done, she wrote to her brother asking for help, none of which was forthcoming, neither militarily, financially or anything else. But Henry VIII did hit upon the interesting idea encouraged by one of his northern nobles, that he might try and kidnap his two nephews. Oddly enough, this left James V with a lifelong um, suspicion of his <laughs> uncle, <laughs> whom he never met. Uh, he, he, uh, he managed to avoid meeting him altogether. We're supposed to meet at York in 1541 yes, and James right. showed up. Uh, when Henry VIII went north with Catherine mm-hmm. Howard during their brief marriage. But uh, so... Uh, Uh, It was a very difficult time for Margaret. I think it says something for her tenacity and the fact that she had not lost the support of all of the Scottish lords by any means. She she wasn't suddenly cast out into outer darkness and left entirely alone with just Archibald Douglas. She did still have her supporters, uh, largely because of the makeup of of Scottish politics at the time. So she, uh, she was able to maintain a presence in Scottish politics. And she did retain, at least for a while, physical control of her two children until the the, the famous incident a year after her marriage to Angus, when Albany, exasperated by her continued sort of opposition and the difficulty she was putting up, besieged her in Stirling Castle. And she eventually, her husband had deserted her by then, incidentally, and gone off to protect his own back. Margaret then, seeing that the game was up, made one of these magnificent Tudor gestures, which which really Tudor women and even Tudor kings, I'd have to say, were extremely good at. She issued forth from the castle, um, holding the hand of little James V, who was by then about three years old, uh, and with her other son in his, his nurse's arms, and gave James the keys of the castle to hand over to Albany so that this would establish his right as king. Because she and others feared that it wouldn't be the first time that a small child who was king had disappeared or died in rather unusual circumstances. And she did fear for his life, I think. And from that time on, she was parted from him for a while during a crucial part of his childhood. She then, of course, she was pregnant with her only child by Angus. Margaret Douglas, as she became uh, at that time. Uh, And she felt that her own life was so much at risk that eventually in 1515, she made a a daring sort of moonlight flit almost (laughs) over the border. Uh, Having, you know, appeared to be going to Linlithgow Castle, she actually went to Tantalon, which was the Douglas stronghold on the coast south of Edinburgh. Magnificent place. Again, no one ever goes there. When I went there, there was one other couple and a lot of seagulls. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, it is incredibly dramatic to high above the cliffs with the North Sea sort of pounding in underneath. And from there, she went south over the border into Northumberland, where she was met by Lord Dacre and taken to Harbottle Castle, um, where she gave birth prematurely and was very ill for a long mm. time afterwards. I mean, she had had some difficult pregnancies while married to, to James IV. She had lost all of their children. I mean, she'd given birth to various children who'd lived for a while. In fact, two sons who had lived for a year or more, but then died. And I think this again presents an interesting contrast, Natalie, with Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. Yes, absolutely. Uh, because, you know, the same thing had happened to Catherine of Aragon. Uh, numerous pregnancies, no child surviving, and in her case, until 1516. But the difference between the two royal couples was crucial, and that was that Margaret was much, much younger than her husband, whereas Catherine was nearly six years older. But, you know, the Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon were not alone in losing royal children and royal heirs. It was just commonplace at the time. It must have been hugely distressing, uh, you know, no matter what. People have often thought, oh, well, infant mortality was so strong in those days that frequent that perhaps you hardly noticed it. But I don't think that that's... I don't think the human spirit changes that much over no, a period no. of time. Uh, so uh, she did... Uh, she then spent a, she went down to London eventually with her daughter and spent an, uh, almost a year in London revisiting and getting to know her brother and sister. Her sister was widow as Queen of France by then anyhow and had managed to to, to marry again. I mean, her Mary Tudor's marriage to Brandon is often presented as a love match. I think there was something more of convenience in it in that as well, that he happened to be around and she was desperate not to be attacked by Francis I of France. So being married to someone else seemed like a good option. Uh, again, this isn't something we know very much about. There is some material coming 
coming to light on the kind of entertainment and socialising they all three did together, which is very, very interesting. But after a year, I'm probably not willing to put up with the expense. And also because of his ambivalent attitude to Margaret in Scotland, hoping that she might be more used to him in Scotland than she was in London. Henry VIII intimated that she'd better go back. You know, her son was king. She was dowager queen. It was where she belonged. So she did. And she made another journey north, not quite as magnificent as the first one, but appropriately accompanied all the way and everything. And of course, remained there for for, for the rest of her life. By that time, James V's minority is one of the most difficult and convoluted in in British history, I think, actually. Uh, It's a very complicated time with lots of nobles fighting each other. And uh, eventually, James V did come completely under the control of his stepfather, who whose family he hated his stepfather and he hated his stepfather's family he had got of course to know his mother a lot better though he had not known her because she'd been absent for some crucial years of his life when he was quite small I think she always had more affection for him than he did for her perhaps and and that might have been inevitable but he certainly disliked his stepfather with good reason who sort of wouldn't let him do anything and tried diverting him with women which certainly worked. I mean, James V had even more mistresses and illegitimate children than his father had done, which is quite a score, really. But uh, Margaret never lost sight of the fact that James was her son and that she needed to support him so that he could rule in his own right. And when he did finally, in the year 1524 to 25, rise up of his own account with support, of course, and kick out his stepfather who took refuge in England, Uh, for a considerable period of time. Margaret again acted as regent for a while. So she had two brief periods of regency, a total of about two years in all, until, you know, James decided that that was enough. Uh, And, you know, his mother was an important figure in Scotland and in his life. By that time, she had fallen in love (laughs) for for another time to her... um, a household servant who was also a, a steward, a distant, very distant relative, Henry Stewart, and she wanted to marry again. She divorced, or at least her marriage had been annulled, technically speaking, to uh, Angus. The annulment came through from the Pope eventually. Henry VIII had been suitably appalled by his sister's behaviour. You know, the fact that she might wish to divorce her husband was something that he thought was, you know, beyond the pale. And he told her so in no uncertain terms, which had distressed her greatly. He'd also accused her earlier on of having an affair with the Duke of Albany. You can see that this was not really a very um, happy sibling relationship. Yes. And uh, throughout all of this, I mean, you, you have to admire Margaret. Perhaps her judgment in men was not good, but then quite a lot of women <laughs> that might be said about. Her son had essentially decided, look, Ma, if you want to marry again to someone this time who is a good few years younger than you, that's fine, but you're not going to pay apart direct part in Scottish politics anymore except that of course during much of the 1520s and even into the 1530s Margaret did play a part because Dr Helen Newsom has recently worked on Margaret's voluminous correspondence and is bringing out what would be an absolute bible for those of us interested in her an actual printed version of all of her letters which has never that's never so existed, exciting never existed before yes I think it's coming out in a couple of years time you know ha- has shown looking at these letters and how they're constructed who actually carried them to Henry VIII and to Thomas Cromwell and Thomas Wolsey and how they were received and all that. But Margaret was a major player in Anglo-Scottish diplomacy throughout much of her life, actually. Perhaps she didn't always achieve the ends that she wanted. But broadly speaking, the two countries were at peace with occasional eruptions of of border warfare and that. She was very canny in how she addressed these who sent them, whether they were delivered by messenger, whether they were personal letters, all this sort of thing. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating and I I think it really does show that this was a clever Tudor player in her own right doing what she could do within the undoubted restrictions of being a woman constantly really under suspicion for being English in 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 Scotland Uh, and and it is quite an achievement Uh, and then of course Margaret came into her own again towards the end of her life uh, when her her son himself finally married. I and mean, he, he left it fairly later, but as his father had done. And his mistress at the time, Margaret Erskine, had hoped that he would marry her. Um, she was the mother of his eldest son, James Stuart, Earl of Murray. But he didn't. Because, you know, essentially, in those days, kings didn't marry mistresses. It, it, 
just lowered the tone of the monarchy, basically. Yes. <laughs> Henry <laughs> uh, changed and, that, didn't he? <laughs> yes, he did a bit, yes. Uh, but um, like his father, James V wanted uh, a good marriage. And he set his sights on one of the daughters of the kings of France, because here again, you have the old alliance. It's good for France. Uh, it's good for Scotland. It enhances Scotland's place in the world. And so off he took himself to Paris. And he did, of course, marry Madeleine, the elder surviving daughter of Francis I. But she was already dying of consumption mm. and only lived for about six weeks after arriving in Scotland. I mean, I know Scotland's got a difficult climate, but it's really not that bad, <laughs> <laughs> especially in the summer. <laughs> You know, it, it was sad, but remarriage was negotiated quite quickly with the Duchesse de Longueville, Marie of Guise, a member of a family who was very much on the rise at the time and would remain so for the rest of the century in France. And Margaret got on well with her daughter-in-law, from what we can tell. And in the summer before Margaret's death, in 1541, James V and Mary of Guise lost both of their sons, Prince Robert and Prince Arthur, within a matter of weeks of each other. They both died. And this was a catastrophe, of course. And Margaret, who had returned to court by that time, when his marriages took place, James V wanted his mother back at court fairly often, in fact, and she was very well treated and everything. And she played a major role in, in consoling them and trying to keep up their spirits. But she, of course, herself was ageing by that time. She went back to Mervyn Castle. I say that dubiously because I'm not quite sure even now how you pronounce some of these Scottish. Yes, it's not Mervyn, but I suspect it's Mervyn Castle and died there of a stroke. Mm. Uh, she sent for her son, but he couldn't get to her in time. On her deathbed, she asked for forgiveness from the Earl of Angus, who was still living in England at the time. Uh, there's been speculation as to why this should be. Uh, and most reasonable analysis of it is that that she hoped by so doing that he would take proper care of their daughter Margaret Douglas whom she hadn't seen for years and years. I mean, Margaret Douglas never knew her mother really and doesn't seem to have held her in any great kind of esteem or affection. If that was the sort of ploy that was intended it didn't work because when Angus died he completely left Margaret Douglas out of his will. So <laughs> as a gesture, it was a rather unfortunate and empty one. But uh, so it, it is an extraordinarily dramatic life and one which has much more interest and agency, as people say nowadays. Yes, that's yes, a very popular word. word. <laughs> very, very popular word, yes. But, but in Margaret's case, it does, because this woman, you know, written off as someone who only likes her jewels and dresses. But yes. of course she likes her jewels and dresses. They are what makes her a queen and they Absolutely. are vital for her public image. You know, without those... What is she? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's not a sign that, that she's some sort of 16th century airhead. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it does show, in fact, an understanding of her role. In the world. And I, I think she's a, a really fascinating and underrated woman. And I am absolutely thrilled to be writing a new <laughs> <Yes>. book. <laughs> yes. It's so exciting. And I do think, you know, that the work of some of our best young scholars, there's also a young lady called Amy Hayes, who's written a very, very good doctoral thesis on the later medieval Scottish queens. You know, this is, is really putting some of these women back into history. I know there is an argument that if you concentrate only on the top people, you lose sight of what's happening in society. And that is true. But these women have been lost sight of almost altogether and were viewed just as baby making machines. And they are so much more than that. You know, a, a queen consort had a very public role to fill in, in terms of her piety, her, um, her cultural role. Um, yes, they were poor things required to give birth almost annually if they could, because it was the only way you could be fairly certain of getting someone who would survive. But they are are more than that and they are more than just ladies cooing over silks and satins as well no oh, i'm so excited for your book i'll be pre-ordering it the minute it <laughs> comes out that is well so i don't think it's oh. going to be out I'm, i've got two years to write it yes. in um, yeah, and i course, have yeah. i have uh, got a fair amount of research already from my book crown of thistles which is about the rivalry between the Tudors and the Stuarts in the late 15th and 16th century but if I was researching it 10 years ago and right. you know things move on new things come to light you know some of these bright new young scholars are, are coming up you, you've got to keep up with with what is current I think uh, and so especially with everything being closed at yes, the moment that it, makes it's a bit very of a challenge so, though there are you know, you can still get things digitally so yes. that of course suggests that you know what you're looking for
and you don't always as a researcher it's only really going into places and you look at something and you think ah oh, you know and you go to the look at the catalog and you find something else that something it's connected else, yeah. to. that you you can still do a fair amount of research but you have to pretty much know what you're looking for in the first place and so there is a certain limitation on it yeah well, it's an extraordinary story and I've enjoyed every moment of, of what you've been talking to us about. We do have something that we do at the end of our Talking Tudors episodes and that's what I call a little game of 10 to go. So these are 10 questions just to get to know you a little bit better. Nothing too tricky. Are you ready for that, Linda? Absolutely. Okay, great. So if you could visit anywhere on earth right now, where would you go? Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Love. I do love Edinburgh. It's beautiful. Yes. And what new skill would you like to learn if you could learn one? I think I'd like to learn how to use voice recognition technology oh. to um, to write because especially as one gets older, you never know quite how mobile you're going to be. Um, I know that, you know, the wonderful historical novelist C.J. Sansom, whose, whose Shard Lake novels I'm sure you're aware yes, of, yeah. he had to learn how to use it mm-hmm. following a very serious car accident. I don't know whether he's still using it. I mean, he may have recovered sufficiently that he doesn't need it, but it's a technology that people don't talk about very much anymore. And it does have limitations, I think, in, in, in terms of using it as a tool actually to write with. I, I think it would take some I'm getting used to but it would be a useful skill to pick up. what was your first paid job my first paid job was as trying to earn some money as a postgrad student at the university of york serving out meals in the canteen of alcuin college at the university of york and i know. absolutely hated it <laughs> um the it's the only time i've ever had to clock on and clock off you know it shows you how long ago it was probably but i did I didn't have a full grant as a postgrad student. I needed some more money and I needed to work. It wasn't the work itself, um, uh, but it was the reaction both of other students who thought it was hysterically funny uh, and of the other ladies who worked in the canteen who were very suspicious of someone intellectual joining them. Um, You would have thought they might have understood the need for money, but apparently they didn't. (laughs) That was my first paid job. I didn't do it for very long, Natalie. After a long day of writing, if you've been researching and writing, what do you do to relax? I tend to listen to a a lot of things on BBC Sounds on the radio. I like radio in the evening um, because, for one thing, my eyes are pretty dry. And, you know, if you've been staring at a screen for for a long time, you don't want to then be staring at TV or or anything else. So uh, there are a series of... You know, there were all sorts of wonderful things that were on the radio in the in the, some going back as far as the 1950s, uh, which are very dated in a way, but but they are quite fun, you know, detective things yes. and things like that. And you can just sit and uh, I have to say, Natalie, sometimes I do doze off while listening to it. But there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely it shows not. it shows that they relax you, and I think that's good. I'm um, the, the the other thing that I do a lot of nowadays, I have to say, is listening to audio books. I do still love reading books, but audio books are so relaxing and, and they're somewhere between reading and actually having it perform. Well, they are a performance of yes, sorts. Yeah. I've listened to most of everything by Dickens again and oh, marveled at what a wonderful writer he is and how great the people are that, that do these readings. You know, they're, they're just fantastic. And I was really thrilled when the um, my latest book on the Mistresses of Charles II came out as an audio book. There's none of my other audio, none of my other books had. And I'd rather hope they might lend themselves to, to, to that sort of treatment. I hope Margaret Tudor will come out as an audio book. Um, Absolutely. They're so popular now, aren't they? People they do are love indeed. them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, if you could visit a fictional place, which would you most like to visit? So maybe from a novel you've read or, or something like that or a movie you've seen? I think I would. Well, of course, it is a real place, though. I don't think the um, probably based on a North Yorkshire farmhouse uh, because of its the extraordinary power of the story and the emotions in it I'd sort of like to visit Wuthering Heights oh yes yes how beautiful how atmospheric it would be yes yeah you need to dress warmly I think yes I think uh, so. probably rather not encounter Heathcliff in there but no. um, <laughs> but but yeah I think I think that would be an interesting place to go yeah, it would to. be an interesting place and I know you've already mentioned some some wonderful things about where you live but what is something that you really love about the area where you live now I do love the fact that it's just got all these really fine historic properties um, within 
well, in many cases for us, within a sort of 25 mile radius. Uh, and the reason for that is that they were always within a day's ride of London. Uh, and yet it was countryside and people, you know, the, the upper classes wanted their estates out there. Uh, and I would therefore have said that one of the things I like about where I live is being close to London. But having said that, <clears throat> Natalie, on February the 28th, it will be a year since I was last in London. Um, wow, that's incredible. So. Yeah, well, it is because of the pandemic. Of course. You know, yeah. I, I mean, it was, I was a bit worried when I went in, even then I went in to right. see my editor about the, the book that was about to come out. And we knew that it was gaining hold. And, you know, I was in taxis and things and someone in their reception was sneezing, which was rather off-putting. But uh, I, I I hope to go back into I'm, I'm not unusual. I mean, it's partly because, you know, I, I've been, um, I'm in a, an at-risk category. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's um, a lot of people who aren't have just not been in very much because, yeah, no. you know, it was best to, to keep away from other people. Absolutely. Basically. No, I totally understand. And uh, Linda, are you more a morning person or an evening person? I hate to say it, but I think I'm neither really. I think no. I'm an afternoon <laughs> person. Yeah. Uh, I, um, I, I used to be a morning person. I'm really not good in the evenings. I actually don't like giving talks in the evenings. Yeah. You know, if someone says, oh, come on, can you give a talk at 7.30? My heart sinks. Because yeah. actually I'd quite like to be winding down by Absolutely. then. Absolutely, yeah. All hyped up and then dealing with people's questions afterwards and all that. So, I, I mean, basically of the two, I'm more a morning person. Yes. Yeah. And what is a subject or an area that you'd like to learn more about? I think I'd like to, to know more about... <laughs> about 16th century France I, I don't actually know I mean I, I know a fair amount about it uh, but not at the sort of expert level I think the the Valois monarchy is a very very interesting particularly the period where Catherine de Medici was regent I don't know that much about Charles IX and Henry III uh, of France and I should know more about Henry IV than I actually do I mean I think if any king of this overall period who comes closest to James the fourth in in personality and interest it's probably Henry the fourth of France actually uh, but uh, and Henry the third was an interesting and, and often misunderstood and underrated king I think I gather there's going to be a new TV historical fiction series about Catherine de Medici called the Serpent Queen which is yes, giving stories of period actual fits I think because they you know they have some fears, especially with the company that's producing it, <laughs> as to how it's going to turn out. Um, but in general, I don't watch historical fiction right. on, on the television. It's just too close and you get so irritated. Yes. By it. <laughs> Uh, and in many ways, I often think it's sort of pointless because, I mean, listen to what I've just said about Margaret Tudor's life. Why would you need to fictionalise it? <laughs> yes, I it's incredible. Right? It. Yeah. I don't get it. I mean, you, you would need to add dialogue and, yes, and things like that, but you don't need to put in things that didn't happen yeah. because yeah. so many of the ones that did are quite hard to believe anyhow. Exactly. That's so true, isn't it? And lucky last question, what is a question that you would most like to know the answer to? And this can be anything. It doesn't have to be historical. It can be about anything, really. I would like to know if Mary, Queen of Scots, did connive in the murder yeah. of Lord. I would like to ask her, but she might not give me a straight She answer. might not give you this. If she had to, yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. Wouldn't it? <laughs> it would, yes. And the very last thing, promise this is the final thing, I always ask my guests for a Tudor takeaway. So it's a little something for our listeners to go off and, and explore after the show. It could be a song to listen to, a, a book to read, a website to explore. Do you have a Tudor takeaway for us? I would suggest the Shardlake, Matthew Shardlake novels of, of C.J. Sanson, which I think bring Tudor England to life in the most wonderful way, um, most immediate way, without stretching any kind of credibility. I do like historical crime novels, funnily enough. I'm neutral about historical novels. There are some absolutely brilliant ones, but there's yes. an awful lot of dross out there, <laughs> an awful lot of dross in historical fiction. Uh, but but I, I do think that, well, of course, C.J. Sansom has a, a, I think, a doctorate in history, actually, Chris Sansom. He's certainly got a background in, he's certainly a history graduate, but he somehow managed to find that wonderful balance between the, the interest of the story, the thriller side of it, if you like, which I would be hopeless at, you know, I'm absolutely hopeless, I, I couldn't do that at all, uh, at conveying what it might have been like to live then. Yeah. Uh, and so it's not all pretty, pretty or anything like that. Yeah. Um, and some of it is quite 
sad actually of course but it they're just so compelling I think so if anybody hasn't read them I really think they they that they should yeah that's a great recommendation it's been a long time since I've read one so you know it's about time that I dive back in soon Linda this has been so wonderful thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today I think you know I've certainly felt like I've learned a lot and I'm so looking forward to your to your new work as well great well thank you very much Natalie it's been a great pleasure to talk to you Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.